Um, thank you. Thank you all for joining us this evening uh, in uh, this time of unrest. I would like to remind folks that the Sierra Club centers its work on the key principles of equity, inclusion, and justice that celebrates people from all walks of life. And we stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matters, our indigenous neighbors whose land on which we stand and for gender equality. <clears throat> I hope beyond hope that after this, that democracy prevails and we come out of this unrest and pandemic in peace and in good health. So Matt now will introduce um, our new director. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sarah Layton. I am the new chapter director for Sierra Club Maine. I am just finishing up my second day on the job. So uh, this is a very exciting time for me as well. Thank you for having me. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, and before we introduce the speakers, um, so I'm Matt Cannon, I'm another staff member at Sierra Club Maine. And um, I, I'm sure many of you have been on Zoom at this point, but um, we will ask everyone to mute themselves for the presentations just to help with background noise. And um, these meetings are recorded live via Facebook. There's folks out there in that sphere listening, and we'll also record it and post to our website. Um, so it'll be available afterwards. And if you do have questions, we ask that you uh, post them to the chat and we'll do our best to answer them uh, promptly after the presentations um, before eight o'clock. So thank you all for coming. And Joan, do you wanna introduce our speakers? Yeah, uh, I'm briefly going to introduce the speakers and since we have a lot of good information to, to hear tonight, so our, um, more information on them are on our website and we have a slide where you can get, uh, where you can see their websites as well for, for more information about them down the road. Um, I just want to welcome our speakers and um, Jim Wilson, president of Ilaho Power Company and Molly Siegel, who works with him from the is an Island Institute fellow. Stephen Strong is president of Solar Designs Associates, and Kay Aiken is CEO of the software company Introspective Systems in Portland. And they will all share their piece of the action in the development of the solar plus storage generator hybrid microgrid design to replace the aging underwater cable supplying Ilaho with energy. Um, Jim Wilson and Molly will go first and, uh, as president of Ilaho Power. He's done a lot of, of work in, in, on this whole process and he is a, he is a retired uh, University of Maine professor of marine science and economics focusing on fisheries ecology and resource economics and he and local islanders along with Molly have worked together to solve critical uh, energy supply problem and secure the financing for it. Stephen Strong is president of Solar Design Associates in Harvard Mass is acknowledged as the premier preeminent authority on integration of renewable energy systems and buildings. He has pioneered the concept of integrated design with applications such as solar electricity, solar thermal and wind, and has worked around the world. And Kay Aiken is CEO of Introspective Systems in Portland, holds a degree in energy slash sustainability engineering and she's helped the island project using her knowledge of the application of complex system designs in relation to a variety of problems focused on the integration of distributed energy resources into the electric grid. So welcome all of you and hopefully we're all set where we can hear everybody and see everybody and um, will Jim and Molly take it away? 
Okay, well, why don't I start and give a little bit of the history of the project and the company and give you all a little context that might help better understand what we're doing. Uh, our company is a co-op, actually a member-owned co-op. We're a regulated utility, probably one of the smallest in the country. We're member-owned and we have, I should say, a lot of infrastructure for the number of people we serve. The island is rather large and it's not populated very heavily. So we've got a lot of lines running around that are expensive to maintain. The company was formed in 1969 by Pat Tully, who was an incredibly clever guy who designed the system and adapted it to very, uh, could I say, primitive conditions on Idaho and made it work. Uh, from 1989 or 69 until 1983, the company ran a diesel, an old Korean War diesel that was obtained very cheaply. And then in 1983, we got a new cable that we put in. Cable runs from Stonington to Idaho. It's about six and a half miles long and follows a very tortured route out to the island mainly because it was put in by a fisherman who knew all the places scallop draggers were likely to go and put the cable where they weren't likely to go. And the result is we've had a pretty well-functioning cable ever since 1983. All right, but we realize now we've got a 37-year-old cable. It's probably 15, 20 years beyond its expected lifetime. And the point of this project is to kind of set the island up for a transition to a different source of electricity when the cable fails. All right, and that's where we got into the solar array that we're talking about in the storage system. The six, eight, ten years before our current time, uh, the co-op looked into a whole variety of different ways to solve this problem. We considered a new cable, wind generation, fuel cells, uh, micro turbines, tidal. Join the meeting. Uh, and when we sorted through all these things, it became apparent that solar with storage uh, was by far the best alternative from an economic point of view. There was very little discussion about going green. All right, it was basically about how we can make an affordable system for the island. So what we wound up with was a design that is going to put in about 300 kilowatts of solar panels. That's about two and a half, three acres of panels and a one, one megawatt hour uh, super capacitor, which is the equivalent of a battery and it has attached to it something called a server, which is the equivalent of an inverter and a microgrid controller. Uh, the island is, we're fortunate that because we purchased power from Amera, we had a meter that recorded hourly consumption every year since we've been hooked up to the cable in 1983. All right, so we know by hour what the island is consumed for 30 some years. All right, this makes it easy to figure out what you need to do if you're gonna continue service in the future. Um, we built two competing models of the system to see how it would work. I built one and Kay's partner, Carol Johnson, was responsible for building another. Carol used a very mathematical approach uh, use data from satellites. Uh, I used data from the airport in Rockland, collected by NOAA, and did it on the spreadsheet. And the two approaches came out very close to one another, close enough that we feel confident that the models are good. All right. The, in order to service the island, the solar system will generate 420 thousand kilowatt hours of power every year join the meeting 
the island only consumes about 270 to 300,000 kilowatt hours. So we've got almost 50% over capacity. And the reason is because of the intermittency of solar power. All right, it's intermittent on a daily basis, obviously, but it's also intermittent on a seasonal basis. The amount of power coming in in January is an awful lot less than the amount of power coming in in June or July. All right, so the problem that this poses for the design of a system, and Stephen and Kay will talk more to this than I will, is that if you have to anticipate that you're going to lose your connection to the mainland grid and have to plan a system that is off-grid and reliable and functioning, all right, you have this problem of intermittency, you have the problem of producing a lot of excess power, and you have the problem of making that, trying to get as much value out of that excess power as you can. All right, it's kind of a challenge in design of electricity that is perhaps, people say, what we're going to face on the mainland 5, 10, 15 years from now, much more widely. So in a sense, this whole project becomes a pilot uh, project of sorts. So uh, I could go on, but let me just stop there with that context. One of the things I want to add is we are really fortunate to have had a number of people who have contributed an awful lot to this. Bill Stevens, who used to be our production manager or our general manager of the company, was very active until he retired last year, uh, contributed an awful lot. Bill had been with the company since 1969. Uh, Stephen Strong has been a tremendous contributor. If it wasn't for Stephen, I don't think we would have gotten very far at all with this project. Kay and her partner, Carol, have contributed a lot of ideas that have been very helpful, especially around this excess power question. And people like Molly, Brian Carroll, who's our current general manager, and a number of other people on the island have all contributed. It's been a real uh, good team community effort uh, that has been fun, especially for me to work with. So uh, why don't I ask Molly to talk at this point and give us a little perspective of the community on this whole project and what they think about it. Molly? All right. Do you want me to talk about the heat pumps or do you want me to talk about the community? Community, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, well, let me first say that I, I came onto this project after it had mostly been designed. And so I'm not responsible for any of the craziness that these guys have been up to. Um, this was all new to me when I moved to the island a couple of years ago. Um, but it's been really interesting to work on so far. Um, just a little bit about Isla Ho for those of you that aren't familiar. There's about 55, 54 year round people. Um, that's this year. Last year it was 56. So we've gone down one or two. Uh, but there were also some babies born. So that was, that was a big deal. Um, so a tiny year round community. And then the seasonal summer community is between 200 and 300. It's really hard to estimate because there's folks that stay on the island for six months and there's five months and four months and people that come for just a month or three weeks. So it's really hard to estimate um, what the actual size of the community is. Um, and that kind of shows up in our census counts. It's always a little bit off and um, it's more accurate to just drive around the island and point to each house and say, who lives there, who lives there. So it's, a, it's an interesting place to live. And um, as Jim mentioned, the intermittency of solar power there's also intermittency of demand. So there are certain times in the year when there's a ton of demand and then there's certain times a year when there's basically nobody here. Um, and so that just, it creates another factor that we have to deal with. Um, and also the year on people are here all year and um, they're needing power all year. But then the summer people come in and have this huge influx into the community um, and they're really important to our community. Um, and they also use a lot of power. And so the 
the array, as Jim mentioned, needs to be sized to deal with the increased demand in the summer, which sizing the array larger raises the whole cost of the project. Um, and it would be unfair to put that all on year round people. So it's, it's been, I think, a challenge and an interesting challenge to sort of even that out um, between the different parts of the community. So um, that's one thing that I wanted to mention. Um, there, there are strengths and weaknesses about being a highly seasonal community. Um, and it's definitely a challenge that is not always recognized. Um, from my perspective, I'm an Island Fellow, which means that I work for the Island Institute, but I live on Isla Ho, which is really awesome because it's an amazing place to live. And it's even more amazing when you have an actual full-time job, which is cool. Um, and I've, I've been really fortunate to live here year round and to spend a lot of time getting to know folks and really becoming integrated in, into the community. Um, I feel like I'm a real Islander now and I think for my takeaways from conversations with folks um, are that people want, number one, reliable power. Um, Idaho Electric Power Company is really well known for being a reliable source of power. Um, it's pretty amazing when the power goes out, usually it goes out because it's gone out in Deer Isle where our cable comes from. And so power will, sh will flicker off and then about five minutes later, I'll see Brian, our manager, driving by in his pickup truck, and I'll know that he's going to start the generator, and then the power is going to come back on in about five or ten minutes. So it's really like that. We have super reliable power. We never have to live without power for more than an hour or so, which for many of you that live on the mainland, it's like, you know, you'll go for three days, and CMP doesn't have your back, and it's, and it's awful, but we really have it have it good here and it's important because we're isolated in a lot of other ways and so people people really rely on that and it's a source of pride um jim was mentioning the story about the cable being laid on the seafloor and i just wanted to mention there's an awesome video um that some of the school kids made a few years back it's a shadow puppet video um, and they made it in collaboration with um, figures of speech theater i think and so if you, if you search figures of speech theater, Isla Ho, it's this really cool video. I would highly recommend watching it. A lot of good history there. Um, so people want reliable power and they want it to be affordable. We have a small year round population. Uh, a lot of them are fishermen or contractors or do odd jobs. Um, they're not sitting with a ton of money. So we have to be really, really cognizant that um, for some people it's the cost of living is high here and we have to keep power affordable and that's one of my roles i work with affordable housing on the island as well um, so reliable power affordable and then you know whatever worldwide recognition comes along with having a cutting edge solar microgrid which people are like yeah that's awesome but if it's not affordable if it's not reliable who cares so my my main goal is to um, help keep, to make sure that this microgrid is benefiting everybody on the island, specifically the year-round residents. Because if we don't have a year-round population, it's not really as, as good a community to live in. And, and it's a really special place to live right now. So we want to keep it that way. Steven? <laughs> So maybe we can uh, go now to Stephen Strong, who I think is on board here, and um, hear how he has influenced this whole process. On your phone? Stephen, I think you call in. It looks like you're on mute. No, I'm, I'm using my phone. Ah, there Great. he is. Good. We can hear you now. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, sorry for the miscue. When I started to uh, load up, Zoom said, oh, you can't join this meeting. You need an upgrade. And when I looked at the upgrade, it was probably a 20-minute process. So I patched it together through the, uh, the Internet. And so you'll be seeing me speaking into the phone. In any case, uh, I'm glad to 
get to talk about one of our favorite projects. Jim Wilson has been quite dedicated to this effort. I don't think it would have ever happened uh, or even been thought of uh, without Jim. And this is going on uh, three plus years now at this point. We work uh, all over the world, as was mentioned, and are very excited about solar plus storage, uh, both in utility interconnected and uh, off-grid applications. And I thought the best way uh, with Joan would be to give you a quick tour of an island scale microgrid that we completed a couple of years ago. So if, if you are controlling the images, I will pull up on my screen and give you a tour of Cuttyhunk Island. Cuttyhunk lays to the western end of the Elizabeth Island chain, which lies between the south coast of Massachusetts and Martha's Vineyard. It's a very popular island because the harbor is very unique and quite sheltered, so it's a favorite hey, destination Stephen, for I cruising think you crowd. Need to Stephen, huh? I think you need to share your screen for us to see the pictures. Well, the, the problem is <clears throat> I'm not on Zoom. Um, you probably have to accept Oh goodness! Do you see a Do you see a share screen button at all with what you're doing? No, I couldn't no. join Zoom. I'm joining by internet. So, did you see my picture? We can see um, you, but we can't see your pictures. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid this is uh, this is not going to work then, because there's. There's no way I can share my screen through the internet. It should is it is it like a PowerPoint presentation? Could you send it to me? Uh, yeah, I guess I could try that. Um, it's not it's not that large, but PowerPoint ends up being large even if it's. What's your email address? Sue Levine, S U E, L E V, E N E, at gmail dot com. Okay. So while that while uh, Stephen is doing that, Bill Turner has asked everyone, uh, and maybe Jim, you could answer this. Um, those winter folks. Would they be able to use heat pumps to use the excess power sustainably? There are about four to six houses that summer people have <laughs> that will use it uh, during the winter. The year round folks are the major target for the installations. Our plan is to start with the town hall, the school, the store, and then move to year-round homes. The last heat pumps that will be installed will be summer homes that are heated partially during the winter. All right. When we get, say, let's say 10 heat pumps operating, we'll consume close to 60% of that excess power. We'll add about 15% to the revenues that the company collects and the people who employ the heat pumps will cut their heating bills by about in half. So if you look at the savings the company gets, the savings users get, that increases the value of this whole solar array and storage process by about 30 percent, which is not insignificant. Is that a good answer? That's that's great, thank you. Um, Sue, how is the Stevens? Um, I have, he looks like he's wandering around. I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm, I'm want, maybe we want to change the order a little you bit. You want me to start? Because I okay, think I've a lot of the technology here. And Go ahead, and, Kay, thank okay. you. <laughs> um, I think I can share 
No, you've dis you've disabled it, so I'll just talk. Oh, uh, what, you you need you want uh, I can put it up. Hold on. You need to share something, Kay. Yeah, it's just easier to do it graphically for people. Okay, how about now? You guys can see my slides? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, now I got to change. I got to change my. Uh, Okay, now you can see that. <laughs> so this, this uh, presentation actually was given to the Smart Electric Power Alliance. I actually, interestingly, I was in Israel when I gave this presentation to the United States <laughs> on travel. So um, this graphically, so people can understand how the project is laid out and what it is. So two thirds of the island of Ilaho is actually Acadia National Park. Um, the 55 residents that Molly talked about are mostly on the north side and a little bit. Um, Jim Wilson is, is um, connecting to us all the way down on the far south side in a place called Head Harbor. He's as far away from the ferry as you can possibly get. Um, so it's six miles high, uh, north south and two miles wide. And the high level goals that Jim really started this and it, most of this was his idea on how to uh, use, uh, he's, a, he's actually a quite a good engineer. He may be an economist, but he's actually quite a good engineer. And he saw that there is a three to one ratio between summer power use and winter power use. And in order to meet enough of the power for the summer, we needed to find more load in the winter. And that was the whole point behind the heat pumps. But overall, the high level goals is, is assume that the grid tie currently to Stonington was going to fail. So we had, they had to be completely self-sufficient. It had to be locally maintainable. And in order to create one of the Island Institute's big mantras is sustainability for the islands. Molly will talk about that at some point. And it's about stabilizing energy prices for the long term. Um, they also wanted to be as, as close to renewable as possible that was cost feasible and try to minimize other fossil use on the island. So the result is up to 20 heat pumps will be put on. What's unique about these is uh, many of them have thermal storage. There are air to water heat pumps that actually store warm water in their basements. Um, the um, Town office has a system like that that's currently going in right now. Um, also, they have a, a product coming out of Canada, New Brunswick, which are uh, air to phase change material. This is sort of like a polymer gel that uh, goes into uh, a small monitor on your wall and it actually stores heat in that phase change material. And then the actual microgrid, which was uh, what Stevens. Uh, uh, firm did is actually design the electrical system uh, to put in the solar and the storage. Um, and then our portion was not only doing system optimization down in Portland, was designing exactly how big the solar array needed to be, exactly how big the storage had to be, but was also involved in, we actually are providing the control, the actual electrical controls for the system. And this is something called transactive energy. And transactive energy is a new way to balance power in the electrical grid based upon the economic value of that power at that moment. Um, this is uh, being promoted by something called the Gridwise Architecture Council, which is the lead advisory board uh, for the US Department of Energy, which I happen to be on. Um, it's as my program manager for the Department of Energy says, this is the next next grid. And actually, um, as far as I can tell, 
Iowa will be the first transact commercial transactive energy project in the world, or at least in the United States. So Maine has something to brag about. And what it actually does is by deciding what the price of power is in real time, it actually, the a artificial intelligence at the devices, so at the heat pump in the person's house, makes a decision. Is it, is, is it a good time now for me to store heat or not to store heat? Is it a good time for me to let the set point in the house drop because my, uh, my I, I like to make the AI kind of have a personality. So maybe the, the AI knows that no one's gonna be home for the next two days. So it will let the temperature drop. Um, so this creates this optimal allocation of resources. It saves, as Jim said, it saves utility money because the storage is actually smaller than it had to be. It also saves the consumer money by providing them inexpensive electrical power rather than using uh, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of gallons of diesel fuel, of, of fuel oil every year. So this is basically the, the grid, the way it is is there's uh, the solar array with the storage and the backup generator. And this is all the work that Solar Design Associates has been doing. Um, the transformer to uh, transform that power to voltages for the grid. And then all the little heat pumps, you can see little green uh, heat pump signs. Those are the heat pumps scattered out onto that grid that actually help balance the supply and demand on the main grid. Um, and our controls are actually uh, very unique in the fact that it's very, very cyber secure. Um, prices are sent to the individual controllers in the, in the buildings um, in a one-way fashion so that hackers can't actually hack your heat pump and work their way up to the chain and actually make the, you know, potentially uh, do some harm on how the system is controlled the uh, heat pumps don't have a direct connection to the devices up above. And then I will, if Stephen is ready, leave that for Stephen. Are you ready, Steve? Who can I you send me your, tell me your email again? Sure, S-U-E-L-E-V-E-N-E -E -E at gmail.com. Okay, this is on its way to you, but it may take a while. All right. Um, so I, I'm going to I'm going to share one more slide. Can you see the Island Institute slide? Everyone? Oh, I are still looking at your PowerPoint. Any. You're still looking at my PowerPoint. OK, let me try this again. Oh. That said Island Institute at the bottom. Yeah, oh, okay. Okay. That's perfect. OK, that's what I want. <laughs> Because um, I'm, Pleat Molly, please, please um, uh, take, please thank Susan McDonald, because this is from Susan McDonald, who's, I think she's head of energy for the Island Institute. I just wanted to show her slide because this really talks about the whole concept that Jim, honestly, Jim thought of at the beginning is how to think of energy as a way to improve the community, how to improve the viability of the community. And this was how to overall um, combine systems because as, a, as, a, as different combined systems together, you actually can be more efficient. It's the idea of building an ecosystem. I like to say in our company, we build engineered ecosystems. Um, and the idea of having both the power generation, which is the microgrid, and also having the uh, consumption in the, in, the, in the case of the heat pumps um, contributing to the overall balancing and, envi and environmental sustainability of the system is uh, a pretty powerful concept. And this is actually something I think um, Suzanne McDonald, uh, this is a, um, one of her conferences uh, a few years back in 2017 or so, which I think Stephen and Jim were both speaking at, talking about Isla Hole Microgrid. <laughs> um, are you ready? Uh, I can oh, go okay, on. So you, you know me, I can keep talking. And if but... I get the file, we'll... It's about a third there. 
So it's still got a ways to go. How about if we can maybe go to some questions if people some have some questions? Good idea. Um, it looks like, um, real quick, Becky, I think, I don't know if we answered Bill's, did we answer Bill's question? Yeah, yeah we did. Okay. So, Beth, Becky, go ahead. I just wasn't clear on, um, is the, um, the Idaho uh, Energy Co-op purchasing the, um, the heat pumps for everyone? Is that, it sounded like, or is there a grant to purchase them? How is that being funded? You want Molly, to take that, Molly or Jim? Yeah, it's a mix right now. Um, we, ha we got a couple of uh, heat pump units donated by, um, given to us by the company that makes them. Um, and these are air to hot water units. So I'm not sure that anybody mentioned that yet. That, um, well, Kate did mention that w one of the types of heat pumps that we're installing are not just air to air like the regular heat pumps, they're air to water. And so they store the heat energy in huge water tanks, um, which is then there's a heat exchanger in there. And then that energy is transferred to your emitter system. So your fan coils or your um, blower, you know, whatnot that puts the heat out into the building. And that's what's going into the town hall. Um, and so those have already been acquired. And then we got a, Kay and Jim wrote a grant to Efficiency Maine for this pilot study, which was a $60,000 grant, um, which had funding for consumer incentives um, to basically on top of the rebate that consumers can get from efficiency main for heat pumps mm -hmm. to add on some more rebate incentives. And so that's gonna help for the private homes. And we're also pursuing other funding to be able to install these units in homes that are owned by the affordable housing organization on the island, the ICDC and also some homes that are owned by the town because the town maintains three affordable rentals. So as Jim mentioned, the, the goal is first to get the, the town buildings outfitted with heat pumps. That would be the town hall, the school, and the island store, which is another co-op on the island. Um, then the affordable houses where a lot of our year-round families with kids in the school live. Um, and then folks that are maybe more, um, have more resources and are able to put in the money to these. So yeah, the answer is that we have some funding secured and we're pursuing more to really be able to fully implement um, the heat pumps in affordable homes. If I could just insert here, I put in air, an air to hot water heat pump in our house. Uh, it will generate heat at the equivalent of purchasing fuel oil at about $1.80 a gallon. All right, and that's using 16 cent a kilowatt hour electricity. People on the mainland can get 5 cent an hour electricity in the evening, which makes it possible to generate heat at a much cheaper rate than you do through fuel oil. All right, and from the island's point of view, the money that is spent on the electricity to run the heat pumps and the savings on the fuel oil all stay on the island rather than being exported to another community. I see Mal with his hand up. You have a question? You can, un I, maybe I can unmute you. You might have to unmute yourself. Nope. There we go. Uh, question for Jim. Uh, can you sell any excess power uh, while the cable is still uh, functional, back to Emera, and do you have seasonal power rates? So, how are you, Mal? It's good to see you. I'm fine, thanks. Uh, I've, I've escaped the plague so far. <laughs> so, we could sell power to Emera, but in order to put in the protective devices that would protect Emera workers who might be working on a down grid, uh, it's going to cost us probably more than it would be worth to actually export the power. I'll, I'll answer that really quickly. It's, it's about fifty dollars to $60,000 worth of equipment to do this. And the ex, because the system's been designed very well by both Stephen and, and my company, um, the, 
the selling, what we would be able to sell is about $2,000 or $3,000 a year and it just didn't pay. Thank you. So Sue, how are we coming with uh, Stephen's PowerPoint? I do not yet have it, but I see some questions in the chat. Matt, do you want to go through them? Yeah, so um, Bill, uh, and a couple were answered by Kay, but just for those who are um, not on the chat, is there any movement to require utilities in Maine to entertain this type of technology? And um, you want me to you answer that? In yeah, please. please. <laughs> so as I answered to, I think, uh, David, um, as many of you know, the uh, Maine Climate Council is pushing to reach the 2045 carbon neutral uh, challenge by Governor Mills. Um, at, in order to go that way, to do that, there have been six working groups. I happen to be on the building infrastructure working group. And one of the strategies that we are proposing for the Maine Climate Council to take up is something called grid modernization and all of these basically a, a lot of the concepts that are happening on Ilaho have been wrapped up into um, that um, strategy um, it was been written by a couple of us but I think the main authors have been Michael Stoddard from Efficiency Maine who many of you might know and myself so we are trying to push the utilities and the state to uh, incorporate this technology into our electrical grid because that's the only way we're going going to be able to get to 100% carbon neutral by 2045. Great, thank you for that. Um, and then just a couple other follow-ups. The Jim's tank is 550 gallons insulated and inside the basement. Um, <laughs> and there's one other question in this regard. Can you use the water for hot water to use in the home? I don't know if that's a question for Molly or Kay. Uh, potentially, yes, but it's not set up that way. I think, Jim, you do use it, right? No, I don't. You don't, okay. I have a separate um, hot water heat pump. Okay, it, it, it is possible to do that. Um, these systems have not been designed that way. And by the way, also the, the tank in the town hall is actually a, a two 2,000 gallons, is that correct? That's two right. two thousand dollar gallon tanks. That's right. One, and they one, are fully insulated. They will be foamed. They're actually septic tanks that are being used for this purpose. Not used. They're they're new, brand new. Serving <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> please. <laughs> but it it is pretty interesting that Bill Stevens, the guy that's installing them, he's building them from scratch out of his own imagination and. Um, so he's just, he's putting together, you know, finding these interesting ways to put together things that he has on hand, like septic tanks, because he puts in a lot of septic systems and he's building the heat exchangers that are going in them. So it's pretty interesting to watch his process. It's real island ingenuity. Um, and maybe we can just do one more quick question before Stephen. Um... Sue asks, would CMP and Amera be receptive to this technology? Yeah, I was just answering that one okay. <laughs> by chat. <laughs> um, uh, can I bash CMP? Is that okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think we're close here. I, I may be able to patch it through Zoom. Okay, um, just to answer that really quick, CMP and Amera has, have not been very receptive, but a lot of other utilities have been. Uh, Duke Energy is looking at stuff, um, Green Mountain Power, California Utilities, uh, the Northwest uh, State, Washington State and Oregon Utilities. So there is movement in the utilities, just not ours. <clears throat> How is the state working with microgrids in general to authorize them statewide? Um, there was a microgrid law passed last session. Um, it needs to be strengthened to allow, uh, in my opinion, this is my opinion. Um, that is one of the strategies that's coming up on the um, strategy from both the energy working group in the Maine Climate Council as well as the 
um, building an infrastructure working group? Uh, it was my understanding that that got through the House, but did it pass the Senate and did it get endorsed by the governor? So it, there, there were a couple microgrid bills. Uh, one of them got, it's called, was the, called the Community Solar Bill. So that was passed. However, there are, are problems with it because it did get watered down in the Senate. So the community solar thing is uh, sort of that intermediate step where you can uh, gather together 200 individual unit owners. Is that correct? That is that is correct. Okay. There's, there's, the, there's, there's, there's parts there's parts of it that start start to go on the path of enabling microgrids, but it doesn't quite go far. That's why we we like I said we we're, we're working on putting in new and, and saying, you know, these are the steps we actually have to get passed and we'll see what happens in the next legislature. So, so we're still waiting for uh, microgrids to actually be uh, approved by the state. Well, microgrids can be approved by the state. It's just the interconnection time is very, very uh, long and hard. Hmm. It's, 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 it's very hard and time consuming. Awesome, we can see, see Stephen's screen, so that's great news. I think there was another question too. Now, um, I was gonna answer quick. This may be a, a just quick statement that uh, the consumer owned utility might be much more um, open to uh, this kind of system for the whole state. Um, yes. Um, my opinion, again, this is my- I also opinion. got the pictures here, Stephen, if you'd like me to do it that way. Um, I think that's a, that's, that's going to cost a lot more than people realize. We need to hold CMP to the fire. Stephen, can you hear us? Yes. Um, want me to put them on my screen? I can, I can do it that way if you'd like. Now I have them now. That sounds like a good idea. Okay. Uh, maybe if I just, can you guys see that? Great, yes. Okay, why don't you go ahead, Stephen, and just tell me to switch the sides and I'll keep moving them down. All right, great, thank you. Cunninghunk Island lies off the coast of uh, southern Massachusetts between the Bedford and Martha's Vineyard. It's a very popular island, especially in the summer, because of the very sheltered harbor. Next, please. The uh, cruising crowd loves this uh, because the harbor shelters and they do suck up a lot of shore power in the summer. Logistics of building a solar plus storage microgrid on the island are challenging. The next. You've got to bring everything across. Uh, this is the tractor trailer bringing the drilling rig. Uh, we were managing construction on the project as well as engineers of record, but fortunately we had people familiar with the folks on the water and they were good enough to line up all the transportation. The batteries couldn't fit on the barge and so, uh, next slide. Uh, they found a small ferry that wasn't uh, in use at the time or was able to take on extra cargo. And amazingly, next slide, they got both battery containers into the rear deck. Next slide. The island had only one area that was suitable for the solar array south facing and not developed. And it was about a mile and a quarter away from the powerhouse up in the upper right corner. So we had to run <clears throat> medium voltage connection along the existing roadway uh, from the solar array to the powerhouse. And this produced some issues involved with um, induction across the line when the Array would uh, start up or shut down batteries, etc. So 
the engineering was uh, a little bit more complex. The next shows an aerial view of the array. It's sized to meet uh, the island's summer requirements. There's a surplus in the fall, winter, and spring, as you might expect. Uh, the same will occur uh, on Ilaho uh, until Jim completes the conversion of the buildings from oil-fired heat to heat pumps. The uh, next slide shows the array inverter and switchgear and the data acquisition. There's uh, 350 kilowatts there on a south sloping site and a stepping transformer. Next slide. The powerhouse has multiple generators uh, because unlike Ilaho, they never had and could never qualify for a cable undersea from the mainland because their load was too small to justify the investment. So they have multiple generators on site. I call it the baby bear, the mama bear, and the papa bear. And they rotate them to try and load follow spring and fall, winter, and of course summer. In the left side in the background is one of the battery enclosures. You get a closer look at it in the next slide. And then uh, opened up in the following slide. And the batteries are not shipped in the enclosures because it would be way too heavy. Uh, they are being loaded in almost like technology drawers into the slots. And, and the wiring comes down the front. And that's uh, what it takes to have a microgrid. Solar plus storage and the generator hybrid interface. The generator interface was a bit of a challenge, as I mentioned. The next slide is one that will provide some open expectation among all of us. And that is that you can see the cost of solar at utility scale and wind at utility scale are now lower than all the conventional quote unquote alternatives. Nuclear is way out of in the stratosphere. Coal is pretty far up there. Even combined cycle gas is more expensive now than solar plus storage, wind plus storage. And this is the case for coal and nuclear even if it's fully a depreciated plant, the total cost, capital cost of installing, designing, engineering, purchasing, and installing a solar plus storage system, plus its operating costs over its lifetime, is still less expensive than keeping the coal and nuclear plants operating that are fully depreciated. So I was hoping in my long career, which is now over four decades, that we would be able to see, that I would be able to see this tipping point where it's not about the environment necessarily, it's not about anything other than economics. Even if you don't like solar, which is a lot of the utilities, uh, Warren Buffett is not a tree hugger, but he uh, has committed to shutting his coal plants down in sequence, and he has invested in gigawatts of new wind and new solar plus storage. So that's the end of the technical presentation. You've got two more inspirational slides, and I can take some questions if desired. Next, there we are. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. When I tied into Zoom, it said, oh, you can't join this meeting. You have to have an upgrade. And that looked like it was going to take 20 or 30 minutes. So anyway, thanks to Sue, we persevered. Stephen, I have Roger. a question. Go, go ahead, Becky. I th and then after Becky, I think there's some questions in the chat. Um, I'm just wondering, Stephen, can you give us, us a sense of what those batteries cost? Oh, uh, goodness. Uh, let me, I uh, don't I'll... have <laughs> access to that uh, information 
uh, can. Okay. I think Kay uh, can ask the answer. I, I, the think, I, I think I can answer that because we're selling them. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the batteries, the one megawatt hour battery for Ilaho is around $600,000. Um, the overall project cost is $1.45 to $1.55 million. Um, but what it, interestingly, what it does is in 20 years, the price of power with inflation, if they had kept the grid and, and the grid was able to stay, the cable was, was still, still had lifetime and would be able to stay there, the price of power would have been about 19 cents a kilowatt hour. And the uh, price of power for the island will go down to about 10 cents a kilowatt during that time frame. So they're actually bringing the cost curve down rather than having it go up slowly. And the, there's a, a, a question about the storage technology. I didn't really mention that really quickly. Um, the pro, the batteries actually are supercapacitors and supercapacitors are very unique in the fact that they have, um, typically they have uh, some major disadvantages when they use in storage, but there's a company um, based out of New York City, but their manufacturing is actually in Dubai in the Middle East um, that has solved a lot of the problems of supercapacitors by using uh, power electronics. Um, and they ultimately have the great um, oh. capacity to actually live, uh, survive on an asset basis for 30, 40, 50 years. And that's a game changer when you're looking at very long term assets. Um, currently, most companies are using lithium ion batteries and lithium ion batteries, depending upon the use case and how you use them, um, will only last between 10 and 12 years. And then you have to replace the battery again. And that was a, a, that was a big problem for the island because the island won't have excess money to, in, in 10 years to replace the batteries. Any other questions? Well, yeah, actually I'll ask a follow on to what you're just saying, which is how sustainable are these batteries as far as the materials used and that kind of thing. So that's another, that's another great thing is lithium ion is pile of tox toxic chemicals. Exactly. Um, Supercapacitors are uh, metal plates with carbon nanotubes on them. That's all they are. I it's saw Becky hand up. You wanna have a question, Becky? Yeah, I, I think I had this discussion with Stephen earlier, and I was, I'm curious to have Stephen talk a little bit about uh, making the supercapacitors uh, uh, able to, to not dump all their, their power at once. Yeah, well, that's, that's the technical challenge that uh, Kilowatt Labs and Maxwell and several others have uh, addressed, and apparently they've worked it out. It's uh, the secret sauce, and none of the companies are really sharing it, as uh, Kay suggested. It's done. Well, actually, power. I can't answer how they do it, but <laughs> and it's not secret sauce. Well, it is secret sauce, but it's um, um, I, I can explain it actually a relatively easy way if somebody wants to know. <laughs> well, I mean, I just see it's a totally different kind of battery system. So what, it's not just kind of depleting itself over time, right? So can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, so, is it applicable in larger scale? That's what I guess we're all interested so in. So the whole process is like a faucet. It's an electronic faucet that allows the power to flow in concert with the magnitude of the load. Okay. And they really uh, haven't offered a whole lot more detail than that. Maybe Kay has some. I don't know. Yeah, I, so, so every battery, either a lithium ion battery or a supercapacitor, are made up a lot of small cells. Um, I don't have my purse with me. I have uh, little small cells that look like a double A battery. That's about the size of the individual cell. And in a megawatt hour, like Ilaho, there are probably three or four hundred thousand of them. And what um, Kilowatt Labs has been able to do is actually able to control each individual cell in concert. I call it playing the piano, and they're able to move charge 
at will anywhere in the battery from one cell to another cell or out of the battery. And they're able to control it very, very accurately to um, match the load. Um, like like uh, Stephen said about, it's like a faucet. Wow. Thank you. Uh, it looks like Sally, is your hand up? Do you want to say something? No, maybe not. Okay. So, so um, Stephen or Kay or, or Jim, could we apply these to rural Maine, for instance, or other areas? I mean, and, and how, you know, how much testing has been done to be sure that they actually can play the piano, as you said? Um, how, how, how can we be sure that it's the piano is going to keep playing? So if I could answer that, this was a big concern that we had in the co-op and the board, and we did a lot of homework. We're basically relying on the experience of three companies, AT&T, Verizon, and a Montana utility called Northwest Energy. Uh, AT&T is putting these units in on their cell phone towers in remote locations. They just put in two uh, in the Sierras. They have 100 more on order, by the way. OK. And Verizon is, a, as I understand it, about to do the same. Uh, the utility in Montana, Northwestern Energy, is put, it has put in a 200 kilowatt hour unit, but has three megawatt hours on order. Uh, these companies have put a lot of engineering effort into this, and you know, we're relying to a great extent on their engineering judgment, but uh, they're put in big investment in this stuff. So we feel pretty safe. And I have two units being uh, being delivered uh, on Thursday. They're shipping on Thursday for me. Well, it looks like, I don't see any other um, questions. Looks like we're wrapping up. There's one uh, question from Facebook from our friends at the um, North American Mega Dam Resistance, and they're working with indigenous communities in Quebec, and they're wondering if the presenters here would be could share this information with their group as well. Sure, no problem. All right, that'd be great. All right, well. Um, well, Matt, would this uh, recording that we've done, would that be sufficient to send off to the number group? Yes, and we can definitely send. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it'll be available both on Facebook, on our Facebook page, and on our website. And if that's enough, that's fine, or else they can get a hold of the presenters and they can do it again. <laughs> or an audience of one? <laughs> no, I'm sure it'll be a bigger audience of one. <laughs> she has a lot of people under it that she knows. <laughs> I think this is a really exciting movement forward in, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, as much as it sounds a little bit dry as you're talking about it, you know, it's been the dream for such a long time that we would have batteries that would do this kind of thing. And so it's, I think it's really exciting and, you know, hats off to Isla Ho for, for, you know, risking this, but uh, living on an island myself, I also understand this process. So it's really, really great that you have done this, Jim and Molly and Steve and, and Kay. It's really, really exciting to hear about. Well, if there are no more questions, I just want to say thank you very much for those of you who attended and for the speakers who have done a great job in spite of the little technology burps. Matt, do you have any? That's it. Thank you all for coming. And yeah, we'll, um, this link will be on our website. It's also on our Facebook page. And um, thank you to all the presenters. And we'll see you in two weeks for our next community conversation with Clo Representative Chloe Maxman um, on the main Green New Deal. And um, yeah, we hope you'll join us. Stay tuned on our website, on the community conversations page and on our Facebook. Thank you all. Great.
Thank you, Thank you for inviting us.